Okay, so I was curious, why is it that people behave so badly online? And also for myself, for my own knowledge, I wanted to see like, why is it that I disclose more things online? Why do I feel more disinhibited online? So I looked into something called the online disinhibition effect, as you guys can see here from the title here. Um, now this term had been around even before this article, but this is the article that everything comes back to kind of like, whenever I read about this effect online, people mentioned John Suler's article in 2004. So I thought I'd share uh, with you guys this article. It's very short, it's only like eight pages, including the references. I'll link it in the video in the description below. But okay, let's, let's go to this article very quickly. Um, the online disinhibition effect, like I said, is when people do things they normally wouldn't do in regular life, and they appear more disinhibited, more loosened up, open, less restrained. A lot of their the social norms aren't there operating on them. It's almost like they don't have a super ego acting on, on them. Okay. Now, there are two types that Suler differentiates between. The benign, uh, disinhibi benign disinhibition is not the damaging kind. It's more like people are just more open, more friendly. They might even do more charitable things for each other. As we can see here, he calls it the benign disinhibition effect. The one that I'm more concerned about is the toxic disinhibition, which he calls here toxic disinhibition in the article. And this we can see is stuff like rude language, harsh criticisms, anger, hatred, even threats. People visit the dark sides of the internet, like pornography, stuff to do with crime, violence, exam, uh, etc. Stuff they normally wouldn't look into in real life. So why is this, right? So John Suler proposes six things, six factors. They are dissociative anonymity, invisibility, asynchronicity, solipsistic interjection, dissociative imagination, and minimization of authority. I'm going to unpackage all of these going through the article. Now, this is just a model. Like in psychology, we have different models to explain things, and then these models are tested and then revised, right? So this being a 2004 article, one of the originators of this topic, uh, this model is not going to uh, capture everything. And even John Schler himself says that some of these factors may play a lion's share for some people and others not so much. And I'll cover future articles uh, down the road, yeah. Uh, but let's just go through this one. So the first uh, factor is dissociative anonymity. This is where people's identities are not known online so much. For example, their, na their names might, might be uh, anonymous. All you might have to go on is like their their IP address or their email or something. Uh, so this kind of lets them operate as anonymous people online as if they don't have to be responsible for their online behavior. Yeah, like it says, they can advert responsibility for their behaviors. Uh, the online self becomes a kind of a compartmentalized self having not much to do with the rest of their lives. So the anonymity facilitates this kind of uh, being more open, even in negative ways. Uh, okay, and let's go to the next one here, which is invisibility. So even if people are not completely anonymous online, like you might know stuff about them, maybe you know them from uh, real life, like classmates or something, still there's the invisibility aspect where you don't see their facial expressions, their body language, etc. And we don't realize that a lot of the inhibition effect we face in regular conversations, like the norms we experience, the normative pressures we experience are because of this body language and stuff. So for, he gives some examples in this article, like seeing a frown, a shaking head, a sigh, a bored expression. These are all subtle or not so subtle signs that uh, have an effect on what we're willing to express in the conversation, right? And another example is the example of the averted eyes. Often when we're sharing something very personal, we'll avert our eyes, take a different kind of body language. And when you're operating online, it's like you're always in that state of the averted eyes. You can't really, you don't, you can't really maintain eye contact. And that's a huge like a powerful cue uh, not to be so open when you're expressing stuff, right? So this is not there. Okay, next one is asynchronicity. This is basically just that the conversations don't happen in tandem, like in real time. You can actually just uh, post something and then go away for a bit. And what this does is it kind of interrupts the feedback loop that's coming back to you. He talks about this, the continuous feedback loop of behaviors that reinforce some behaviors and extinguish others. We're not getting that. We can just run away from the conversation. And this often facilitates something he calls emotional, well, somebody else he quotes as saying emotional hit and run. Like you can just put your message out there and then kind of like you're running away. You're, you don't have to face the consequences right away. So you feel a lot safer in saying things online. Okay, next one is solipsistic introduction. I encountered this word solips solipsism from consciousness studies where it's like you think you're the only mind in the world operating. And this is kind of what happens online because 
everything you read is kind of mediated by your own voice, right? Like when I read your comment, let's say, I'm going to read it in my own voice, in my own head. So you become kind of just a, a character in my psyche. So, okay, so let's go through this. Yes, and then, uh, so let's just go through this. So when you're hearing it in your own voice, kind of, you're sub-vocalizing it as you read, projecting the sound of your own voice onto their text. Then it almost seems like you're un unconsciously seems like you're talking to yourself, which encourages this inhibition, right? Because you you often imagine things, fantasize about things, so on, uh, in your own head that you don't talk about with other people. So this encourages this kind of effect. Okay, dissociative imagination. This is um, kind of going beyond anon anonymity, and also. Uh, so we talked about how in anonymity, your online self becomes compartmentalized. So you feel like you don't have to take responsibility for that person. Now in dissociative imagination, you're actually going even beyond that. You're kind of combining anonymity with solipsistic. Uh, well, no, okay. You're adding imagination to it and you're developing that character, almost like a video game self. And then uh, you think that the normal rules and norms don't apply to that self you've created online. Uh, you think you can relinquish responsibility for that character. And then when you're done with that online self, you can just return to your daily routine and carry on where you left off. Uh, so he, he talks about this, like it differs from the anonymity because you're going way beyond it. And you're actually developing that compartmentalized self. So it takes a life of its own. And then you kind of have two different selves operating, one online and one in the real, real world. Okay. Minimization of status and authority. This is the last one. This is where we don't realize that a lot of authority and status we recognize from the trappings of the person, like their their clothing, their demeanor, the way they, they carry themselves, etc. And none of these cues are operating there online. Um, so he talks about how online relationships are, feel more like peer relationships, as if everyone is on equal footing, right? Like you don't really notice that many titles and stuff, like not even the, the disapproving looks or whatever, nothing. You just feel like everyone's on par with you. Same level of status, wealth, race, gender, etc. So yeah, so you're, you're not enforced by that uh, external pressure of authority and status and stuff, okay. Now, so we went through all six factors. He mentioned some other things. Another one is like, of course, personality plays into this. And, and if I decide to make more videos on articles like these, We'll talk about the, uh, I think it's the dark tetrad, where it's stuff like Machiavellian, Machia, Machiavellianism, sadism, narcissism. I can't remember all of them, but these obviously have uh, a part to play in this, right? And then he, he mentions two other things like histrionic styles, where you're very open and emo emotional versus the more compulsive people are more restrained. Except that this guy's coming from more from a psychoanalytic background, which I don't really put too much stock in. But whatever, personality definitely plays a huge role, and we'll cover that in future videos, hopefully. The other last part here is super interesting, I thought. I really want to cover this. This is that people have this uh, mistaken notion that your online self, if it's disinhibited, that means it's more your true self. You're showing your true colors online. So if you're being an asshole online, that's the real you. <laughs> and then uh, what you're doing in everyday life is just sugar-coated under a veneer, right? But this is kind of a wrong way to look at it because... This assumes kind of a Freudian notion of like, I read his book, Civilization, and it's discontents. He talks about like, I think it's called the, a palimpsest, where things are written over each other, almost like a layered self, where your core self is the real one, and then you have layers of like social norms, social controls, control that you put, up, put on yourself, so on. But it, this is not how it works, because it, it, this kind of evinces a bias where you think the good self is the real you. Uh, he just says that here. Yeah, people are more readily... People are more ready to accept true as those traits that they regard as positive and productive. But we don't realize that those positive selves include the social control, controls built in there, right? Um, so it's more like your personality is like a constellation of uh, cognition and affect. And then you invoke different constellations of those characteristics depending on the environment that you're in. So you might bring certain parts of your personality to the bear in like a, in a text conversation. He talks about this here. Different modalities may evoke different parts of yourself, different constellations of personality. You might act differently in a video game set setting. And this also depends on whether it's social, vocational, fantasy, whatever. And each setting lets you 
see a different perspective on that person's identity, right? So maybe maybe being at the asshole, like uh, bullying someone, is it was always a part of my personality, right? It's, it's always a part of me. It's just that when I'm in an environment where I don't feel that what we would call the outside containment or outside pressures, I let it go because it's like, what the hell, why not, right? And then in another environment, maybe I'm bringing another constellation of myself to bear where it's like, okay, I've got this uh, education I've received. Um, I do have some altruistic intentions. So we're seeing that constellation of affect and uh, cognition. So yeah, just keep this in mind that there's no true self that you're trying to un unravel uh, or something. We're just bringing different parts of ourselves to bear depending on the context we're in. And this kind of proves provide some hope because if you're trying to structure an online environment or any kind of environment, you want to elicit those parts of everybody's self uh, that are that are conducive to good living, right? Okay, so that was this 2004 article. It kind of sets the foundation for the online disinhibition effect so we can talk about it further uh, in the future. And I'll try to cover more articles. Thank you.